Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So today I was really questioning what topic I should make a video on. I was thinking a bit about Ottawa, thinking a bit about Montreal, but then I came back to Toronto. Now, one thing that I don't think gets talked about kind of enough is line one. Now, of course line one does get talked about in some ways. We often talk about how it doesn't have enough capacity, how it's kind of it's the crown jewel of the TTC, but there's a lot of negative connotation, and I actually think we don't really talk about the future. When we talk about the relief line, we often talk about the relief line like it's going to become the new premier line in Toronto, and it's going to solve every problem in the TTC system, and it's going to become like the most critical subway line. But the reality is that that's really not the case. You see, well, the relief line will definitely take a bunch of people off line one because people often get to line one via a bus. And so people coming from the east and perhaps a few coming from the north will now be able to take the relief or Ontario line instead of line one, which means yes, indeed, there will be a lot less riders coming onto line one. However, what people don't seem to understand is that that doesn't change the reality that line one has been around for over 50 years and the entire city has been shaped by it. I really recommend people to just go and walk up Young Street. You can start at the lake and just walk all the way up to Finch and even go beyond Finch. It's a couple hour walk, but it will really give you perspective on why Line 1 will never ever become this, you know, underutilized line or why no matter how powerful and how big the relief line is, Line 1 will still be very busy. It's because along the whole route of Line 1, there is a ton of very high density development. The thing you'll notice if you walk from the lakeshore all the way up to Finch and perhaps even beyond up to Richmond Hill Center is that there's just a ton of development. And the reality is, knowing as I'm someone who's lived pretty close to Line 1 before, there is zero chance that someone who lives close enough to just walk or uh, perhaps take a short bike ride to a subway station is ever going to get on a bus, uh, kind of jog out to the east and get on the Ontario Line, which means that Already, these kind of baseload people who are living right near Line 1 are never going to get off Line 1, get on a bus, and go head over to the relief line. That means that Line 1 is always going to be busy. And Young Street has a ton of new developments coming online. Not to mention that Eglinton and Shepherd, etc. all feed into Line 1. So it's pretty critical that we continue to upgrade it even after the Ontario line opens. So I guess this video is kind of about what do we do to take Line 1 and kind of build it out to its fullest capacity? Many people talk about Line 1 as if we're anywhere near its total capacity, but I actually really don't believe that's the case. Of course, we will need to spend a lot of money in order to upgrade different pieces of the line, but when you consider the cost and the fact that Young Street is Toronto's most critical corridor, so beyond just building a new line underneath the Young Line, the best chance we have to kind of upgrade the capacity and improve the experience is just to piecemeal slowly upgrade Line 1 up to the standards of some of the greatest metros in the world. So here are some of the changes I think I'd propose in order to bring that capacity up to the next level. And when I say the next level, I mean I think that Line 1 could do over 40,000 people per direction per hour, where it's currently sitting at I think about 30,000. So that's a pretty significant increase. Let's talk about that. So the first thing we can do is add additional cars to the Line 1 trains. Now, this alone will not give us that much more, maybe another 2,000 people per direction per hour. However, there is room on the Line 1 platforms for a little bit of a longer train. In addition, once ATC is online, that's of course not a problem because the train can be aligned perfectly every time, or relatively perfectly. We can also consider trains that have a slight overhang on both ends of the platform in which we can fit uh, you know, a piece of car that has a bunch of seats in it and just adds to our overall capacity. Next up, we can go to uh, kind of longitudinal seating, i.e. the bench seating where you have people facing inwards on the train. That will allow for a lot more standees and increase capacity even more. I believe that and the longer train alone should add about 3,000 people per direction per hour. Generally, if we just increase the amount of crowding on Line 1 trains, we could increase the people per direction per hour, but I'm trying to uh, keep the standard of uh, how busy a train can get before people just aren't willing to get on it the same. So beyond that, platform screen doors is another thing that we not only can seriously consider, but that will be required in the future on line one to handle all the patronage. So the first thing we got to do is decide 
Where do we want the doors on the trains? Once we've decided our final train configuration, we can install platform screen doors and then we're pretty much going to have to keep the door arrangement the same because of course platform screen doors are designed around the door arrangement on the train. Now once we have platform screen doors, trains will be able to enter and leave stations at kind of full tilt acceleration. They're not going to have to slow down to enter our crowded platforms, etc. And this will maximize our peak capacity. That's probably another at least one or 2,000 people per direction per hour. Now beyond all this, there's a lot of other things we can consider to just improve the capacity on line one. Another thing we need to consider is upgrading stations in the downtown core. One thing you'll notice in other systems, especially the SkyTrain where uh, I'm from in Vancouver, is that they've actually done extensive renovations of the most critical stations, adding significant numbers of escalators and the like. One thing that's crazy, if you look at it, is that most of Toronto's downtown stations still have very limited vertical access. So adding things like two escalators per platform and elevators and redundant elevators these are all critical things. If you look at a station like Dundas, that could use a whole another concourse area, uh, as well as college could also use that. In fact, pretty much every downtown station on the Young Line could use significantly more passenger waiting and access areas. Plus, given the fact that there are lots of developments along Young Street, it's not unreasonable to expect that some of them could incorporate such areas. Now, along with the train access improvements I've mentioned before, the platform screen doors, the increased train length, and the like, we can start to see a line one that could carry 40,000 people per direction per hour. And depending on how flexible we are, uh, if we extend the platform a little bit more, we could potentially have even longer trains and then have, of course, even more capacity. Anyways, though, guys, I think that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I was just trying to banter and kind of think, of, tell you what my thoughts were about line one and how we can increase its capacity. I don't think the TTC has been kind of uh, creative enough with that. Given when you look at a lot of systems around the world, they do things like selective door opening, you could do something like an AB shift where you have a seven car train and just the first six cars park at one station, the last six at the next, something like that. There's a lot of options for how to improve our capacity, we just have to be willing to try them. Anyways, thanks for watching the video guys, and have a good night.